Okay, good evening, everybody. I'm gonna call our meeting to order of the ETAC, Envision Eugene Technical Advisory Committee. I am Tiffany Edwards, your fearless chair. And um, we're gonna start off, I'm welcoming you all. Um, we're gonna start off with just a, a couple of quick uh, protocol, standard protocol uh, items, Zoom meeting, Obviously, we are meeting virtually, um, and uh, we'll hope everyone, we just want to encourage everybody to keep your camera on, keep yourself on mute unless you're speaking, and then uh, raise your hand by, you can do this because I can see you, but if you could just use the, um, the raise hand feature down there, it literally says raise hand. Uh, that's helpful because then it puts you in order for me. And I think that's about it. Um, I think we can go into we've got we've got a couple of a number of absences today as well as some folks that are going to be a little bit late joining us. So I think if we want to just uh, I'll review the agenda real quick and then we'll go into approving the Zoom meeting summary from last meeting. Um, Today we're going to, once we get through this, we're going to go into the growth monitoring and building permits section of the agenda. And then, uh, so, so Heather and Elena are going to take us through that. And then we're going to jump back up into the ETAC membership update. Um, and so that's basically what we've got for this evening. So maybe we won't need the entire meeting time, but you never know. So I think, uh, at, that, at this point, I would um, ask if there is any questions or discussion or anything on the Zoom meeting summary from last. Elena, yes. Um, I just noticed today actually that I I had John and Howard as the chair still um, on the, the version that I had uploaded. So I fixed that and that's all that I changed. Okay. Heather. Thank you. Heather, yes. Um, so I miscounted. I think I counted Elena as an ETAC member. Um, we only oh. have, wait, wait. yeah, Ed yeah was, we only have Ed was here. Ed oh, was that's here what it was. Oh, yeah. Ed, yeah. What happened oh. to Ed? I don't know if he's having internet issues or something. And I think Rick would probably have to um, abstain. And I don't know if there's anyone else on here. So we might just punt to actually the minutes. That's fine. Oh, I would have to abstain as well. Yeah, okay. we can come back to the minutes. So you're off the hook. We'll come back to the minutes. Um, so given that, we'll, we'll just come back when we've got uh, you know, enough folks that can vote on that, that we're here. Um, I guess public comment would be next. Um, Elena, can you see if there's anybody? Do we know that phone number? We know if that's a member of the public that would like to speak. I, I don't know if it is or not. Um, so, so we reserve time uh, at the beginning of this meeting for uh, to hear from the public. So, if there is anybody who is interested in uh, addressing the ETAC, I would just ask if you want to raise your hand or somehow maybe unmute yourself if you're on the phone. It sounded like we had someone a caller that we hadn't identified. So, if the caller would like to speak, you can press star nine, and that will raise your hand for me. Don't see a raised hand. Yeah, okay. All right, well, it looks like we can probably move on from public comment. And I apologize if, that, if that's not the case, um, please let us know, but it sounds like we can go ahead and move through. We're just moving right along this agenda. Um, we'll, we're just gonna skip down to the third item and then we'll come back and cover those other items. Um, so I'm going to kick it over to Heather and Elena to kind of pick us up where we left off on the growth monitoring building permits discussion. Does that sound good? Yep, sounds great. Okay, the floor okay. is yours. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna share my screen.
It just takes me a minute here with the juggling of slides. We can see your your presentation in. Yeah, I have to get open of a second version, so I have my notes. Okay, <laughs> sorry. No problem. I just know it's all it's not always easy to tell what we're seeing so right. Yes, I wish yeah i'm sure at some point it will be easier, probably when we're not doing this anymore. Okay, so um, and just a reminder that I um, can't see you guys if there's questions so please feel free to um, stop me Tiffany if i'm not seeing anything. So um, yeah, so we're picking up from where we talked last time. So at the last meeting, we talked about the number of net new dwellings. So not just the new dwellings we've seen over the monitoring period, but the number of net new dwellings. So we tried to account for demolitions, um, replacements of, um, housing with different housing types, additions that added dwellings, that kind of thing. Um, so now we're gonna break that down a little bit more and just look at the net of those net new dwellings, which one of those uh, or how many of those um, were part of an efficiency measure that the city took action to do, and I'll talk about what that is a little bit more, but um, took action to do that would allow or incentivize development to use land more efficiently than we have seen in the past. So um, we're gonna talk about the results. Um, like I said, definitely um, we can either wait till the end to ask questions or we can ask questions as we go. I can always go back on the slides. Um, and then the last item will, is actually the last item on the um, agenda, which is talking about where we're at with the report and kind of just, I wanna kind of give you guys a schedule update every time um, we have one of these meetings. So um, what is an efficiency measure? It's kind of a wonky word, I feel like. Um, it is language that is in the Oregon Administrative Rules. Um, and so essentially the way the urban growth boundary analysis works is that um, you figure out what your demand is for the next 20 years for housing and jobs. And you figure out how much land you have. That's your buildable lands inventory. And then you determine, and I'm grossly oversimplifying, but then you determine whether or not your um, land supply has enough capacity to accommodate your growth for the next 20 years. And that is typically based on looking at past development trends and then projecting those forward onto your vacant and underdeveloped land. So, if you come to the situation like the city did where um, we did those calculations and we actually didn't have enough land in our land supply based on past development trends, we didn't have enough land to accommodate the um, housing and job projections for the next 20 years, then you do what's called efficiency measures. And those are actions that um, the city can take um, oh, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. So if somebody's not muted, if they could mute, that, thank you. Um, those are actions the city can take to facilitate development or to help make it easier for development to um, use land more efficiently. That's why they're called efficiency measures um, than would have otherwise occurred without these incentives based on those historical trends. Um, so some people um, think of them as like compact development measures because it really is, they really do facilitate um, fitting more 
development for more jobs and more housing on land than you would have otherwise seen. Um, so efficiency measures, um, actions can be things like changes to your land use and zoning code um, to remove development barriers or providing um, financial incentives, um, increasing the, and, uh, sorry, financial incentives. They can be prog programs that you're putting together um, or other actions that, um, like I said, increase the expected capacity of the land for additional jobs and homes. So specifically, and sorry, this is got a lot of text on it, um, but specifically, what did the city adopt as part of the urban growth boundary analysis as efficiency measures for housing? So we um, said that we do see accessory dwellings, um, but that we would actually see more than we've seen before by amending the land use code to remove some barriers, make it easier to do them. Um, and also to provide, um, this would be, an, uh, so this for accessory dwellings, it was a combination of efficiency measures or incentive tools. So amending the code and also providing credits um, for system development charges. So SDCs is the acronym there. And so those are charges that are assessed at the time of the building permit. Um, and they have to do with impacts from new development, whatever new development it is you're proposing at the building permit, you get charged system development charges for putting more pressures on um, utilities like roads, water, stormwater, parks, etc. And so this was a in, uh, financial incentive that would give a credit back so you don't have to pay as much for accessory dwellings. Um, affordable housing land bank sites, those are part of our affordable housing um, programmatic approach to reduce barriers to getting more affordable housing in Eugene. So when we're talking about affordable housing here, I'm talking about it with a capital A. So um, it's for low income households. Um, and the city has a program where we will buy land and what we call land bank it. So we sit on it until the time is right. Um, and we then go out to, um, we put out an RFP and go out to affordable housing developers to have them, um, we basically sell the land to them for a lot cheaper than market rate and then work with them to um, build an affordable housing project on the site. So, um, hey Heather. Are, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. You, it looks like you have a, a reboot uh, window that's telling your computer that it might restart on you. And I just want you to know so that you're. I'm not, oh, I do that. Tiffany. I'm not seeing that either. Maybe it's it just me. Is it on your computer? <laughs> yes. Sorry about that. I just say what's right. Apologize. Okay, it wasn't yours. It was mine. No, that's okay. Do if I go me? away, it's because my computer decided to suddenly reboot. Okay, I think we're good. Sorry about. Okay, that. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Um, thank you for letting me know, though. That's yeah. Good. Well, it was right on the cover of what I was seeing from you. So that's why I just thought it was on your screen. So yeah, Elena and I've had some awesome experiences like that, where we were trying to change something on our screen, but it was actually being, it was somebody else's screen. So we totally get it. <laughs> okay, so let's see if I can. There we go. Okay, are you seeing my presentation? No, we're seeing that you've started screen sharing, but it, it's not, we're not seeing it, what we were seeing before. How's that? Now you're like super, super zoomed. Giant auto save button. It's red. That's very weird. And now I'm not sure what is my computer and what's not my computer at this point. Hold on. Great to see you, Rick. Great. 
Sorry, everyone. I think I'm gonna have to close it and restart it because it's actually blank on my computer. We were going fast and then... <laughs> Okay. I, yeah, I can see it. Great. Okay, back to affordable housing. Um, I apologize. I just have to chime in and let you know that I am getting this, this message that's wanting my computer to reboot. And it's giving me the option to extend for one minute or restart now. So if, if you lose me, I don't have a vice with me right now at the moment. So just bear with me and I'll be back, but. Okay, Elena, you can see people's hands, right? Yes, I can. Okay, so um, we'll deal with it that way. If somebody has questions, just use the raise your hand feature. Um, so Elena can make me stop talking. Ed has his hand raised. Oh yes, he does. Ed, <laughs> go ahead. You're, you're muted. Thank you. Um, so Heather, on the accessory dwelling units, the land use code amendments, isn't that pretty much what we did last Wednesday or are we talking about more? Um, no, you're right, yep. So we would just, yeah, and I'll talk a little bit more about um, the challenge with that particular incentive and what to count um, when I get later into the presentation. But yes, this is the land use code amendments that actually started several, you know, in 2018 and then have been back and forth in remand. And then the state um, kind of made some parts of them moot um, so that we had to implement them anyway. Um, so that's yeah, the, but the big, the bigger part of that incentive is really the SDC credits. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then, you know, Sunday, I'm, I'm kind of interested on the land bank banks because a major concern that I had that I asked myself all the time, or where are the sustainable housing projects going to be built? Great. Yeah. Well, we can talk, we can, I mean, this is a program that um, our community development staff work on. And so they have to have money to be able to buy those sites and land bank them in the program. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit more about that because again, these are incentives that we adopted based on the information we had, you know, several years ago. Um, and so I think that they're will end up being hopefully more um, dwellings that we're gonna see through our different affordable housing programs, not just the land bank site, but um, some of these other ones that we're gonna talk about. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna move, I think I covered land bank sites. Um, I'm gonna move into downtown programs. So this was one of our programmatic um, incentives. Uh, so it's a couple of things. Um, you may or may not know that the city has staff that is focused on um, helping development, facilitating development downtown. Um, we've got incentives and that's within the downtown plan boundary. We've got financial incentives like the multiple unit property tax exemption or MUPTI. 
And then we also have um, the urban renewal areas, which are um, part of those are, there is a downtown urban renewal area, and then there's a riverfront urban renewal area. So those all together, when we adopted our um, UGB analysis, those together um, were where we thought we would be able to get more housing through those programs downtown. And I'll talk more about that. Um, we also redesignated land um, in, to low density residential. And so um, we had a, a couple hundred acres over um, off West 11th, south of West 11th in what we call the Crow Road area. And then a couple other areas in Eugene that were much smaller, but the Crow Road area was the main area that was designated on our comprehensive plan. So it was planned for medium density residential, um, but it was zoned for R1 zoning, which is typically um, compatible with low density residential plan designation. And so at the time we were looking for how to fit more low density residential inside the city. Um, and that area was planned for higher densities because it was close to um, an industrial kind of, an area planned for pretty significant industrial employment. Um, but those planned land uses were done decades ago and they were done before the West Eugene Wetlands plan was completed, which identified um, hundreds of acres in that same area of industrial land as protected or areas to restore. So um, the, those areas were rezoned. They have, they're, a lot of them are protected um, due to natural resources, significant natural resources, but we never addressed um, the land use pattern that was planned for that area that would have worked in conjunction with a lot of employment there. And so that was an opportunity to um, lower the densities that we were going to assume there and really plan for those medium density um, densities that were going to happen to happen closer into the core, um, closer in on ex other existing medium density areas. Um, and so that leads me to the last bullet there. I'm going to skip over the 2013 for a second, um, which is that we amended the land use code for the R2 zoning, which is what's compatible with that medium density residential plan designation. So we amended the code to increase the minimum density required when you build in an R2 zone. And so uh, it's kind of like taking some of those densities that were in the Crow Road area and then accommodating them through the land use code amendment to increase minimum densities in medium density that was elsewhere in the city. And oftentimes medium density and high density in commercial are you know, along transit corridors, closer to commercial areas. And so um, that strategy worked with the um, thought of getting more housing closer to corridors and commercial areas and um, creating more 20 minute neighborhoods. So, so those two bullets kind of worked in conjunction. And then um, the bullet about 2013 student housing um, or projects that received MUPTI, um, after we ran the buildable lands inventory in, in 2012, um, council was starting to have the conversations about what to do with the MUPD program. And so we did almost like a little mini monitoring and to give them the most up-to-date information about how many dwellings would need to be accommodated through the downtown program, including MUPD, how many more. Um, and so there were a um, couple hundred dwellings in 2012 and 2013 that were incentivized in a way as being kind of student housing or had received MUPTI at the time um, that we had already counted on happening. And so 
um, that's its own line item because it's a little bit different than um, the additional on top of that thousand um, dwellings that we needed to get downtown. So I'm gonna go into this more, but I just wanted to give you a high level about what those incentives are. Um, there are some additional measures since we adopted the UGB that are related um, and seem relevant for us to track through the monitoring program. So LERPD, <laughs> another great acronym, low income rental housing property tax exemption. So that works in conjunction with our affordable housing land bank site and also with um, some system development charges, um, credits that we are able to give for affordable housing. So sometimes a project gets all three of those incentives. Sometimes it just gets one of those. I'll talk about how we're tracking those, but it seems important to um, acknowledge those incentives. Um, also, we have updated our transportation system development charges um, so that you get some credit again, so reducing permit costs um, for certain types of development that are within, um, I think it's a quarter mile of key transit corridors and our downtown. Um, and then we anticipate, there are some more, but these are kind of the main ones right now. And then any code amendments that we do in the future um, that will enable or create more capacity than we would have otherwise seen are things that we're gonna be tracking. Okay, so that was a lot. So what does that mean? So um, <clears throat> first, just a reminder that what we're looking at here is net new dwellings, just like we were last week. So the number of net new dwellings, uh, the way that this chart is divided up, it's showing the total number of net new dwellings each year in the monitoring period. And then, and so that matches the number we were looking at last week, which was 8,010 dwell, new dwellings. And then the ones that, um, the portion of the bar that is dark orange is from efficiency measures. So these are new dwellings that um, participated in or benefited from in some way those incentives that I was just um, identifying or talking about. A uh, couple other things on this chart is that we've got a gray line here. This is the average number of dwelling, new dwellings that we would need to get from efficiency measures per year to meet our goal um, at the end of the, the 20 year period. And the dark line, the black line here is um, what we've, the average that we've seen to date. Um, and the average line for what we've seen to date, even though it goes over 2012 and 2021, it actually only takes into account full data years um, because otherwise that would make our averages artificially low. Um, so what is what are we seeing? So um, overall, there were almost 2,000, so 1,966 of our 8,000 new dwellings um, utilized efficiency measures or were an efficiency measure in some way. Uh, the number of efficiency measure dwellings was slightly higher on average, so that's the black line here, during the monitoring period than what we forecasted to be needed, excuse me, um, over the 20 year period. Um, but that, but this is we're, right here, we're not talking about individual efficiency measures, we're just talking about totals. And so the picture is a little bit different when we break it down. Um, the dwellings with efficiency measures was forecasted to be 137 dwellings per year, but the actual annual average um, for again 2013 through 2020 was um, 212. Um, and the average um, was definitely impacted by a couple of these things. So 2015, 2016, 2018 were pretty low years. And then 
you know, we had some pretty high years here. So that's the beauty of looking at an average is it, it averages all of that out. So now I'm going to take just the part, the orange bar. Oh, Heather, is there a question? Yeah, just Rick's got his hand up. So I'm going to let him go ahead and, and ask. So Heather, when you determined that these um, number of units were based on efficiency measures, did was there an interview of the builder to find out that he did it because of those or there just happened to be some in place and they got built? I'm thinking of the University of Oregon stuff, I'm gonna guess 13 and 14 when people were building, taking, effect, taking benefits of MUPTI, but really didn't need them to make the projects feasible. Yeah, no, we definitely did not interview anybody. This is purely um, quantitative from the numbers. So, um, and I'll break it down a little bit more once we get into um, looking at each specific efficiency measure and tell you how we, um, how we counted the dwellings associated with that efficiency measure. But yeah, we didn't interview anybody. Um, you know, the idea here um, at this point is that we're still, you know, we're still at that point where we're just trying to collect the data. Um, but that qualitative piece about what does the data mean, um, we don't have that yet. And that's, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that, um, I'm not sure that we're gonna have time to do that for the monitoring report, but I think it's something that we should, you know, we should talk more about. It would seem Heather, to... Heather, real quick, you guys, I'm sorry. It's, a, it's about to shut down on me. So Kevin is after Rick. And then I'll be back as soon as I can. I'm so sorry. Okay, thanks, Tiffany. Keep talking. Keep, I'm trying to sign on with my other computer. <laughs> so, so Heather, um, the reason I asked that, and and I, and if we can get to the qualitative part, would be that it would allow decision makers to understand the effectiveness of programs, particularly if they think about scrapping a program such that has occurred back about 13 or 14 so that we understood what programs were really successful and what programs maybe didn't add anything. Yeah, um, yeah, you're absolutely right. So, so making that distinction again, the 2013 permits that I mentioned, you know, um, got, you know, my, most of them were student housing oriented, received MUPTI, and then council was considering whether or not to um, keep MUPTI. And so we were able to sh um, give them the numbers that said, well, we, you know, somehow we have to accommodate these additional um, multifamily homes. And there's a, you know, general agreement that um, getting those higher density homes downtown would be ideal. And um, so they did re-adopt the MUPTI program, but they revamped it. So it really is a different program. And so that's part of the reason that we're keeping those two numbers separate is because they are, you know, those housing units were approved under different, it's kind of a different incentive type in a way. Um, and they have to do much more now, I believe there is more documentation required about um, the need for, the MUPTI incentive that I am not, I don't know what is required for like LERPD. I mean, I think you have to, um, I think for the affordable housing, you have to um, demonstrate that the housing is going to be at those price points. And then I believe you have to sign an agreement that that's who, you know, that those price points are um, the households that you're going to be renting to. So I think in, I think for, you know, it might be pretty limited as far as um, which efficiency measures we need to do more digging on. So that could be a good thing. Um, okay, Rick, I see that you're muted, but your hand's still up. So I'm gonna assume we're okay to go on to Kevin. 
Okay, great. Perfect. So big projects um, take several years between the time uh, a developer comes to you for a construction permit or even a planning permit and then construction permit and, and then getting an occupancy permit. When do you start, when do you, does this effort actually count the unit? We count the unit at permit issuance. We're not using occupancy and we're not using permit submittal. Um, it's somewhere into in between the state. Um, oh, permit issuance is a pretty common um, point in the permit process to count it. Um, our database, however, is so it kind of, this is this is pretty complicated stuff because these efficiency measures are all from like different data sources. Not all of them are the same. They're very um, unique. So like accessory dwellings is is pretty easy to capture because they're proposing an accessory dwelling. You know, so the the type is there. The building permit type is right there. Um, incentives go through a variety, and this might be what you're alluding to, a variety of, um, first they submit for the incentive, then they have to get approval, then like with MUPTI, it doesn't actually, they don't actually receive the incentive until they've built, it is actually built. And so we are capturing any any dwelling that is past the, um, like for the financial incentives, we are capturing any building permit um, that is past the, I submitted for this um, incentive. So that even if it isn't receiving it yet, we have all of that information because we do recognize that there's a bit of a disconnect um, uh, particularly with in, um, financial incentives that they don't start and stop at the same time as a building permit getting issued. So with, because of the scale of some of the new high rise developments, you know, we, it, um, you're gonna see this kind of fluctuation. I mean, Eugene's not such a big city that we we're talking dozens of those projects. So. You know, one or two going in, um, you know, it's going to create some big orange bars, and then you'll have a year or two with out those kind of big, great big projects. So I just, um, as you say, it's complicated. Um, I have another question that may be simpler to answer. Um, what can I just before you ask that question? Can I respond to that really quick? Yeah. Um, I think Elena, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe one of the 12 story apartment buildings that was in the efficiency measure group um, was 208 units. And one of the other ones was 357. So one was is the former Cafe Yum site on Broadway and one is the former Travel Lodge site also on Broadway. So. Um, that's a good example of um, two big projects that take up a lot of that efficiency measure real estate. So, and, and this may actually relate to those two projects. How, what designates a student housing project? Yes, great question. Um, so can I say that? Um, till we get to the student hat. Is that okay? <laughs> okay? Okay, we'll come back to that one. Thank you. All right. I don't have any other hands up, so. Oh, okay. So now, so now we're just going to break it down a little bit more. And um, of the orange bars here, the, the dwellings that came from efficiency measures, um, let's look at how, what plan, what comprehensive plan designation um, the land was that those dwellings um, are going to be built on. And what we've done here is simplified it a little bit. And so we're just saying what plan designation category. So is the, are the dwellings happening on um, 
well, actually, this is more relevant for the next one. Um, but basically, we've we've identified low density residential, medium density residential, and high density residential. Those are our residential categories. These or the orange color will make sense in the next um, chart. But these are what we're calling our residential category of plan designations, and then commercial is the one where um, is our commercial um, category. Um, and so what we saw here, and again, just like in the last chart, which I don't think I said, in, um, in this chart, some efficiency measure or some dwellings, some projects will receive more than one efficiency measure. In the last chart and in this chart, that dwelling is only counted once because we're talking about total dwellings that received efficiency measures. So those affordable housing developments that maybe received both were on a land bank site and they got an SDC credit, those are only counted once in these two charts. Um, let's see. Um, so what you're seeing here on the left is the total number of new dwellings, like I mentioned before, that we have seen from efficiency measures and the adopted forecast, the total for um, the next, um, for the 20 year forecast. Um, this does include, that forecast does include the dwellings that we're supposed to get from increasing the minimum density in our two zones. Um, but however, this 101 units in medium des density residential does not include dwellings that have been a, um, a result of that change in R2. And the reason that is, is because we're going to have to do a separate analysis on that. We're actually going to have to look at um, our overall density and see if it had, on average, is it higher than it was you know, if we hadn't had that minimum density increase. And so it's not as easy as some of these are where you're just counting units. Did, is it an accessory dwelling unit? Okay, I count it. Is it, did it receive MUPTI? Okay, I count it. In that case, we actually have to do a density analysis. And so we're gonna have to bring that information back to you. But I wanted to be sure to point it out because, um, I think it was about 566 dwellings that we thought we would get by bumping up that minimum density. So it's most of the MDR forecast. And again, we're just not showing it here. So we'll have to come back to you with that. Um, so the other thing that you're seeing here, this one is pretty low. So what, so medium density residential, um, the majority of the efficiency measure dwellings that we're seeing here are actually affordable housing developments. Um, so that 566 that I mentioned isn't being accounted for here. So this you have to take a little bit with a grain of salt right now. Low density residential is another one where right now we're showing 182 dwellings. I'm gonna talk about accessory dwellings in a second on the next slide. Um, but part of the reason this is so low is because of um, the for compared to the forecast is that the forecast was for hundreds of units to happen. It's also around 500 units um, to happen on that redesignated land out in Crow Road. And that area is not served with um, utilities yet. And until that area gets served, um, the area can't annex and therefore it can't develop. And so um, that's a, I would say that is the reason that this is so low is that there isn't the ability for that um, additional capacity to be realized. Hmm. Um, high density and, com and commercial. Um, so we've got, this is a combination of um, the, thousand units we need to get downtown through MUPTI and urban renewal and being in the downtown plan boundary as well as those 2013 permits. So those two amounts were split between high density and commercial with commercial being the most, having the most of the forecast. 
Um, and so what we're seeing, what we've seen is that um, high density is actually above the number of dwelling units with efficiency measures is actually above the forecast. And for commercial, it's not above, but it's pretty close. Um, it's about, I, um, I think we calculated about 88% of the forecasted need has been met. And so what these middle bars show you is if the trends that we've been seeing over the monitoring period continue, at the end of 2032, where are we going to be at? So what you're seeing is that, you know, we've seen a lot in HDR compared to the forecast. If the trend continues, we'll be above the, you know, well above the forecasted need. Um, same with commercial, well above. And again, we're going to break this down some more, but just on its face by plan designation, that's what we're seeing. And then again, for low density residential and medium density residential, because of the unannexed land and because we're not looking at the R2 um, density increase right now, um, these both are really low. And um, this information, if you remember from the meeting, last week, it corresponds because what we saw last week is that, yes, we've had 8,000 dwellings, new dwellings, um, but about uh, over 5,000 of those have been multifamily. And so if you think about the type of housing that occurs mostly on commercial and high density, that's going to be multifamily housing. And so um, it's, this isn't really surprising. Um, I think when you look at the totals, um, it's kind of deceptive because of some things that we've talked about here about the unannexed and that we actually have this need in MDR that we haven't talked about yet. Sure, I have a, Kevin's got his hand up real quick. Yeah. Go ahead, Kevin. Just, just a quick question. In the commercial land use category, we're still counting units, right? Resident dwelling units. Yep. Okay, thanks. Yep. All right, so, so we, we're slicing and dicing our new dwellings, our new efficiency measure dwellings by plan designation. Now we're gonna look at the individual um, measures and by plan designation. So that's where these colors come in that we looked at before. So again, residential categories of plan designations, commercials in blue. Um, when we get here, we're using those same colors. And what you can't see in here, but this is what the gray bar is showing, is um, the further breakdown of LDR, MDR, HDR. So we have that information, it's just for simplicity, um, we grouped them together by these kind of, is it happening on residential land or commercial land? So this first chart that we're looking at is more of the citywide actions. Um, and so dwelling, so not looking at downtown, but looking at our other efficiency measures. Um, dwellings, like I said before, some dwellings have received more than one incentive. So um, there are some projects that were on affordable sites that also got um, the low income rental housing property tax exemption. Um, so what this, so you can't total things from this, you can't total dwellings from this chart, but what you can see is the effect of each individual um, each individual incentive, although again, some projects, especially, especially affordable housing, needed more than one incentive to make them viable. Um, so what else do I wanna say here? Um, are the R2, again, the dwellings that are above and beyond what we would have gotten in R2 are not being addressed here. We're gonna to have to bring that information back to you. Um, this is, you know, like I was talking about residential redesignation. So we said we would get 645 units from that. And just going back 
Our total efficiency measures in low density residential is 729, 645 of those are from that redesignation. Um, so some of the areas that have redesignated, some of the smaller sites, there were two smaller sites that we redesignated to low density residential and those are developing. And so those are counted in here. Um, Heather, real yeah. quick, I know, yeah. I know Alexis, Alexis has his hand up, so. Oh yeah, great. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry if I missed this, but it, was there no forecast for the low income rental housing property tax exemption? Right, there wasn't. Um, so we we had a forecast for land bank sites, but we didn't have a forecast. And I'm trying, I believe it was because of the instability at the time of the funding situation. Um, you know, a lot of this, a lot of this funding comes from federal dollars. And so I believe they weren't, sh we knew we had sites in the land bank program. And so that's why um, we had well, actually, we only had one site at the time and we didn't know if we were going to be able to get any more. And I believe we didn't know, um, how much we would be able to do with Lurp D. But, um, we do feel like now that we have been able to use it, that we should count it as an efficiency measure because we would have at that time. Thank you. The other thing that's not being shown here is accessory dwellings. <clears throat> so as we talked about before, accessory dwellings had a two prong approach. One was amending the, the code to remove barriers to building them. Um, the other was the systems development charges credits. Um, so again, kind of like our, the R2 efficiency measure where it's not like we're saying we were not gonna get any accessory dwellings. Um, we said we were gonna see a bump in accessory dwellings um, because of the code changes and the system development charge credits. Um, it's really that net increase over the average that we would have otherwise seen is what we need to count. Um, and so what we did, and this is something I wanted to kind of chat with you all about. Um, I was having a hard time figuring out how to put it in this chart. And so I wanted to tell you what the results were, but we're gonna have to figure out how to put it in, in a chart or in a separate chart, which is that um, since the original code amendments and the system development charges, we have seen 44 new accessory dwellings. Um, but if you look at the average that we saw that we were assuming we would get without the efficiency measures, um, then really there's only 20 extra um, accessory dwellings that we've seen with, um, since those code 20, basically 20 above the average that we expected we would already see. So I think that there's only 20 accessory dwellings that we would really count as efficiency measures. Um, and I just don't have a way in our current chart system to show that. And so I think what we're gonna end up probably doing is amending this chart with some text to show that um, there's actually 40 dwellings in here that are accessory dwellings. We just don't have a good way to show it on this chart. But I also don't wanna leave it out because um, there's been a lot of work on ADUs and, um, and it is part of our strategy for sure. Okay, moving to the next slide, we'll look at downtown. So these are our downtown focused efficiency measures. So you can see different from this one where it was like citywide, mostly residential plan designations with the orange. Um, downtown is primarily happening on commercial land, um, but there's a little bit happening on high density residential. Um, so again, just like the last chart, um, you could have a dwelling that is, um, and you will have dwellings that are meeting more than 
one downtown or um, have more than one downtown incentive. So if they're getting a MUPD, uh, multiple unit property tax exemption, the area for MUPD is downtown. And so they're also gonna be in the downtown plan boundary. However, there are some dwellings that happen downtown that didn't get MUPD. And so that's the difference here. Um, what this group is, is, is trying to get a sense of um, if you put the, the dwellings that were in the plant, downtown plan boundary, got MUPD or were in urban renewal together and only counted them once, um, how many dwellings did we get through that programmatic approach? So um, that's what we're seeing here. This is the programmatic approach. Dwellings are only counted once. Um, also, this does not include dwellings that were in here. So these are those 2013, the earlier MUPD program, those are here. And then after MUPD was adopted, those are here and here. Um, so what else do we wanna say about this one? Um, Oh, student housing. So question about how we define student housing. Um, when, when this analysis was done back in 2013, we, um, it was defined as any housing that is within a quarter mile of campus, U of O campus, um, and then any housing that was um, specifically marketed or designed to students. So Capstone, the 13th and Willamette project, um, that project is not within a quarter mile of campus, but it was clearly marketed and geared towards students. Um, even the developer name, which I'm, I wanna say it was like collegiate planning or something like that. So there's indicators there, even if you don't look at the floor plan or something like that. So that's what student housing meant here. Um, we, uh, moving forward, I know at the last meeting folks, some folks asked how much of the multifamily housing that we've seen produced has been student housing. Um, we changed that definition a little bit to um, make it a little bit easier to track. So we said anything that's in the West, I think we talked about this last time, um, and we can change this definition, but right now it is um, dwellings that are in the West uh, structures with more than three, three or more dwellings that's in the West University neighborhood boundary and the South University neighborhood boundary, um, or that is, again, marketed, designed clearly for students and isn't, wouldn't be, or I, how do you say, um, wouldn't be easily, so if you have floor plan that, um, where everyone has their own door, then that might be more of student housing where everyone has their own door into their bedroom um, and, and out, um, more almost like a quad kind of design. But then also, I think we have one that was called the collegiate, you know, there's just some like key indicators that it's geared towards students. Um, and so that's what we tried to, focus on is clearly within those two neighborhood boundaries because they are university area neighborhoods um, and particularly West University has quite a bit of um, apartment housing and then also recognizing that that's not enough and so capturing you know that housing that's geared or marketed specifically to students that's in like Fairmount, downtown, um, you know, anywhere around. Um, I think somebody brought up the area on the um, over by Autzen. So definitely trying to flag those also as student housing. But um, particularly here, it was a little bit more of a um, smaller uh, or a little bit different definition. 
Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is that even though this says urban renewal here, um, we have had some housing develop in the urban renewal boundaries, but they didn't actually use urban renewal money um, to support the, um, the development of the housing. And so we didn't, even though it says urban renewal here, um, there hasn't been any yet that use in the monitoring period that actually used urban renewal funds. However, we are tracking um, any housing that's happening in urban renewal areas because you know there's there's a leveraging that happens with new development happening around each other, and it could be that there was nearby development that did actually receive urban renewal funds that um, that they're kind of building off of. So we want to make sure that that story. Um, it, we are able to kind of tell that story, um, but also be really clear that here we're, we're more fine grained in what we are actually counting as an incentive. Any questions on that one? Or the last one? I was gonna say, I don't, I don't have any hands. Oh, Kevin has his hand up. Kevin, go ahead. Just an editorial comment. Um, you're explaining all this to us, which is really helpful. When I read through this stuff earlier, like this page um, was really hard to sort of figure what we were counting. But I think as a standalone document, as you're headed toward sharing documents, having a mixed page like this where some of the stuff the units are being counted once, like the left-hand column or the left-hand grouping. And then the other three, um, the units aren't being counted just once is really kind of confusing, mixing them all on one page, unless it's Got it. really clear. So I would maybe suggest that it, it'd be better to have a separate page if, you're just counting them once versus multiple times. Just it's how visual, you know, our, our brains work. We see graphs and we see, they all look like they ought to be kind of the same thing on this page, but they're not, distinctly not. So yeah. just something to think about. That's great. I think that's super helpful. That's exactly what I'm looking for. We're in the process, as you guys know, of writing the report, which has, you know, basically what I'm reading to you, the, the things that I'm explaining to you are almost word for word what's in the report. So all of that detail is in the is in the growth monitoring report accompanied by these charts. But any feedback you have, um, you know, one of the things that we've shown earlier um, and we're showing again here is this trend bar, um, which is in the middle. I really like the trend bar it also creates a lot of bars. <laughs> and so, you know, um, yeah, absolutely. And as you know, once you see the whole report too, there's opportunity for us to, you know, um, maybe like one thing that you could do is you could split this into three charts. You could say, here's all the incentives 2012 through 21 just a bar for each of those. And then here's all the incentives with their trend, so one chart. And then the third chart would be, here's all the incentives with the adopted forecast. You know, So there's, there's multiple different ways we can slice it and dice it. And I definitely um, appreciate folks' opinions on that. I like seeing the, them grouped though, uh, with the actual, through 21, the trend, and then where you have a forecast, that, having those all on one page is helpful because you, you really see that. You don't have to flip pages. But I think it'd be helpful to actually explain on the page um, what you mean by trend. Not uh -huh. everybody, maybe understand that. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. That's good feedback, Kevin. Anybody else have any input, thoughts? 
for uh, for the folks who joined us a little late, just wanted to let you know we we jumped right into uh, agenda item number three. So we still have yet to approve our Zoom meeting summary from last meeting. And we also are going to cover the membership update. So you haven't missed those things. Um, but I just wanted everybody to know we're going to circle back. Mark, I see your hand up. Go ahead. Mark, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> I'm interested in the distinction between what is forecast and what actual demand is or, or turned out to be. And I think it's very valuable to, to show the, the, the comparison to, to the forecast, but it would also be a value to know how good the forecast was essentially, I guess is what that amounts to, but where we are relative to actual, actual demand. And I just wondered, presumably that kind of point could be covered in text um, as opposed to one more chart, but I just mean, you know, it'd be, it, it's an interesting question that seems to me to be very, very pertinent. So if I could clarify, because I'm not sure. Um, so the adopted forecast is supposed to be what we thought the demand was, or no, I'm sorry, not demand. Um, what we need the demand to be, um, because we are basically saying that um, we couldn't fit all of the housing that we need for the next 20 years inside the UGB without these efficiency measures. So we need to accommodate 1,300 housing units um, downtown with efficiency measures. Or, or um, and maybe this is what you mean, is did we get more than a thousand downtown that didn't use the efficiency. You know, like, is that what you mean? Like how many, how many dwellings downtown didn't use an efficiency measure? And so did we not end up needing that many? I'm, is that what I'm not so much concerned about how the efficiency measures play. Okay. I'm thinking more in terms of the forecast, I mean, I can understand what you tell us about the forecast being determined the way it was, but how the forecast um, worked. That is, was it right or wrong? I mean, I don't mean you need to say that. I just mean in on the ground, there's an actual demand for for housing. And and there's a forecast for that for what that demand will be. And those two may not be the same. Yeah, so at last at the last meeting, we did look at um, you know what the forecast for housing was um, based on the housing mix. And what we saw was that the amount of housing built on the ground was primarily or mostly 70% um, multifamily housing. Um, and it, the number of multifamily housing units that have been built slightly exceeded the amount we thought we needed for the next 20 years. And so we had a good discussion at the end of the meeting about um, how this is just looking at the UGB um, the adopted UGB targets, um, I hate saying targets is a different term, um, amounts that we need to meet, our need. Our need. Um, and that doesn't mean there aren't other demands like, do, is all of a sudden, is our affordable housing issue gone? No, right? And so just because we may have met our multifamily need because the demand was so high, um, doesn't mean that we actually um, still don't have a need for more multifamily housing or more housing at different price points. And that's, that's where it's hard too, right? Because we're in, we're trying to um, address our UGB adoption needs. That was the box that we created. 
but we also don't want to ignore all of these other things that are going on in our community. And so, um, so I don't know if that's kind of what you're getting at, um, that our, the demand apparently exceeded what our forecasted need was for, um, for multifamily housing. Okay. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Yeah. Howard, um, you have hand up, go ahead. Yeah, um, will there be, or is there an analysis of which efficiency measure um, was the most was most effective. Um, when I, what it seems to me that uh, all of this should provide the council, you know, policymakers, uh, some idea of what what works and what doesn't work. Um, kind of a in a, in, a, in a, the efficiency of the housing efficient, efficiency measures, especially as it uh, relates to city investment. You know where. Where is the uh, most bang for the buck? Um, and uh, and then the other comment is just going forward, you know, do we need more student housing? I just saw in the Register Guard, you know, a new dorm, the you think building, I think uh, 650 uh, beds in that uh, in that unit and then all the commercial stuff that's being built, uh, you know, it just seems uh, a lot more student housing going forward than will be needed in the future. So I'm just kind of curious, you know, what uh, what analysis is being done to determine um, which of these efficiency measures are, are going to uh, get the city where it needs to be, uh, especially uh, affordable housing. Yeah, so um, two things. One is, and I think I even have this as a statement in our draft report, is that we've been saying for a while now, isn't the student housing bubble going to pop? <laughs> um, and for like years. Um, and so the demand, speaking of demand, apparently is still there. Um, and so it, but it, it will stop at some point, especially if U of O is not going to um, grow as fast as they thought. They are projecting still some growth, but it's pretty, uh, it's not like aggressive growth. Um, so, and then there's a difference also between dorms versus the housing units we're counting here, which are on private or private development. Um, you know, I would say that is part of what we're trying to do here. And if you look at redesignation to low density residential, um, it has not been successful, right? Um, so we've seen 71 homes, new homes um, on land that was redesignated to low density residential, but we need 645. And so that's a really good example. And the reason it hasn't been successful is because we have an area of the city where the majority of that redesignation occurred that is unannexed. And so until services are out there and the area is available for annexation and the development um, demands that area to develop um, or the market demands that area to develop, then we will see the success um, we will see that capacity realized. Um, our affordable housing land bank sites, this was our forecast 55, we saw more there than we forecasted. So that's been successful. Um, LERPD didn't have an amount, but based on what I was saying before about uh, it, us being unsure, this has been successful as well. Um, and I would say, our downtown programs have been successful too. We need we need a thousand. Um, I think what did we say? This is a little over sixty percent. Um, so so we have seen success there as well. So I mean, on you know, so you're seeing you you are seeing some air some efficiency measures that have been successful and some haven't. And it's not you know, with LDR, it's not because the measure itself wasn't successful. There's underlying issues with it not being annexed that is hampering that capacity from happening. So yeah, that is exactly what we want to um, put a point on, a fine point on. Heather, I have a question, but I'm gonna let Rick go ahead and then I'm putting myself in the queue. So Rick, you're up. So Heather, when we talk about student housing, 
there's a completely different model at work than what we anticipated when we started to develop this. If I'm not mistaken, we assumed about a 5% vacancy in student housing. And yet the new student housing projects that have been built over the last few years, these big mega projects along Franklin, are actually operating at somewhere around 20 to 30% vacant. And the way they're developed, the developers don't care about that because they're being paid out of these huge equity funds. They're not going for bank financing. They're going after a completely different model where they're these equity funds are paid to build and to manage and so on. And the owners of these equity funds are tens of thousands of people who throw a few thousand dollars into these equity funds. I think when we talk about student housing and the bubble, we need to understand that there's a whole different dynamic working than what our model was built on and what the general market for multifamily housing is built on where you're talking about rent, cost to operate, feasibility, and so on. Student housing, these big mega buildings just aren't under that same model. And I think we need to be careful when we talk about student housing as being overbuilt. It's overbuilt under the assumptions that we had, but I don't know that I'd say it's overbuilt based on the way these equity funds are trying to develop, develop these things. Yeah, so vacancy rate, we assumed, so refresher on vacancy rate. Um, when we do a um, projection about how much land we need and how many dwellings we need to accommodate our population growth, the first thing we do is we say, okay, what's the projected population growth? Divide that by an average number of people per home and that comes, we get that from the census. Um, and then that tells you how many dwellings you need to accommodate that growth in population. Because right now that's all the UGB analysis is focused on. And we talked about last time how, you know, there was probably a deficit in housing before we even focused on just the growth, but that's all the UGB analysis is focused on is um, we need, you know, X number of units for the growth. Um, and so then you say, okay, well, that's just to meet the growth, but we know that a healthy market, housing market, has some amount of its housing stock that is vacant to allow people to transfer in between housing units. You can't have them totally full because then nobody can move, um, and you can't adjust your situation, whether it's due to cost or, or needs, and so we bump up, we add 5% um, to the total housing need to plan, basically to plan for some of our new housing stock to be vacant, um, or in general for at least 5% of the housing stock to be vacant. So that's where that 5% came in. It wasn't about student housing only, it was about housing in general. We planned for 5%, we added 5% to our housing need um, so when we say we need 5,105 units, dwelling units by 2032, that includes um, assuming some portion of it would be uh, vacant or it would allow for vacancy within the, the greater context. I think that's what I wanted to say about that. Well, but, but, oh, oh, the other thing I would say is that the UGB planning process doesn't specifically tell you to plan for student, like you don't divide it up by student housing. I mean, frankly, defining student housing is pretty challenging. Um, you know, there is a, uh, you know, there's dorms, which are on campus that those are group quarters, jail, remember our favorite jails, nursing homes, dorms, those are group quarters. Um, then there's you know, all the other multifamily housing. And so the population forecasting for Eugene in Lane County does take into account the need to accommodate students. And, um, but then when we do our housing analysis, we don't um, say, well, we're specifically planning for this amount of housing that's private, private development for students. We, it's broader than that. You're looking at multifamily housing by structure types, but not necessary, not, specific to student housing. But my point here was that if, we, if we're if we saying that, well, 
at some point, because we have all this excess student housing that we have ample multifamily units, we could be shortcutting what is actually needed by the general population because we've got such a large vacancy in student housing that these, this current market seems to accept as part of the owning of these buildings. Um, I mean, some of these buildings are sitting 25% vacant and those are significant numbers when you look at all of the student housing that's been built, particularly these large mega buildings, that can have a great effect on what the need is for the rest of the market, particularly when we're trying to talk about affordable housing in multifamily. We could say, well, we've got too many already because look at, we've got a vacancy level that's above 5%. We don't need more units, but in fact, we could very well need more units outside the student sector. Yep, and that's that larger community context that makes, um, we talked about this at the very beginning, right? That growth monitoring is gonna be giving us a lot of data and the data is not necessarily gonna tell you the answer. Um, it is gonna tell you something, but it's not actually, it's not necessarily gonna tell you exactly what you're looking for because there is a larger context that, um, that you have to put the data into. And so I think that is one of the hard parts is, um, and that's why we talked about it a bit last time is that um, when you just look at the numbers, it says we've met our multifamily housing need to 2032, but that doesn't tell the whole story. And the majority of those were, um, uh, let's see, um, 1,600 of those we had flagged as potentially student housing, and of those 1,600, 96% of them were 20 were structures with 20 or more dwellings in them. So those are big, bigger apartments, and not necessarily, you know, duplexes and triplexes and things like that. Okay, I have a question. It's an annexation related question and I assure you all I do not, I know this is a controversial issue and I don't wanna debate this, but I have a question about, because when I look at this redesignation to LDR chart and it shows that our adopted forecast and is so significantly uh, basically underperforming I've often thought about, you know, areas like Santa Clara and whatnot, and I know that the, I, I don't know where this policy comes from where, you know, we don't force annexation, we just, you know, but at a certain point, we have to factor in the fact that there is a very, I, I want to say it's actually the majority of dwellings in the Santa Clara area that are within the UGB that are not annexed in, and so you know, decisions to have to expand will, that will actually impact that because if we can't get, you know, people to annex in. So I'm curious about, has the city, have they ever considered, you know, we've got incentives like Mupti and Lurpti and all these other things. Are there any incentives that the city has to, to uh, encourage people to annex? Well, I want to just step back. back. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I just want to, before annexation, there has to be utilities within a yeah. certain like 300 feet. And so that is not the situation for the majority of the properties out there. So, um, so the city can plan to serve those areas with um, the major infrastructure that's needed to even allow them to annex. So that's that's kind of the first step. Um, so in this case, it's not really about that there's a bunch of land that okay. is available for annexation. Yeah, it's a little bit different. Um, but that is definite. I don't know if there has been discussion about that. It's definitely something that um, I, you know, could be talked about in the context okay. of land. One of the things, some of the information we will have um, that we are monitoring is um, land annexation. Um, you know, over time and how much of our different um, land supply types are annexed versus not annexed. So how much of our vacant land is actually what, you know, I think about is readily available for development and how much is it? Okay, just was my own curiosity. Um, okay, I don't have any other hands up. So if we wanna move on, I think we can. 
Great. Well, thank you all. That was a great conversation. I really appreciate the feedback as always on ways we can make this more digestible um, to the public and to you all and everyone else. Um, so give you an update, the ever moving <laughs> schedule. Um, so next steps. So we had hoped at the October 7th meeting, we would be going over the report. I don't think that's gonna happen. Um, some of the things that we are dealing with is that, I may have talked about this a little bit last time, but um, when you're looking at a development site that's got multiple building permits um, or even just one building permit. If you guys remember our Fifth Street redevelopment, Elena's Fifth Street redevelopment example, where we have to divide up the impacts of the development by the type of building that is, so what, how many acres of our buildable lands inventory is being developed by housing versus commercial versus industrial. Um, when it's all on one development site, it's very, it's very challenging to automate that um, going to the right bins of, um, for accounting and to also make sure that we're not double counting um, so that, again, when you've got those mixture of uses that you're not saying, oh, it's an acre and it was an acre developed with housing, but it was also an acre developed with um, commercial retail you know, you wanna make sure that those are separated. And so we're just having some difficulties with making sure that that's coming out right. And um, just like this data was pretty challenging to make sure for the similar reasons, um, it's pretty important. Um, we wanna make sure that we have the right amount of impact to the buildable lands inventory. Um, so we're not ready to bring you those charts. Um, but hopefully we'll have them for the next meeting. And I think the amount of time that it has taken as we're focusing on that, we're not able to write the report. Um, I do wanna let you know the status of the report just so you can mentally prepare yourselves. Um, it is currently 115 pages. Um, and so, yes, it's like a thesis. Um, the way the report- it's Notebook is pages or, you know. <laughs> Right. No, actual, you know, we use 12, 12 point font, um, <laughs> but it, it is kind of a layer of onions where they're uh, um, onion layers is how I think about it. I like to use a lot of food analogies um, where there's an executive summary and then you peel that away. And then there's summaries for each topic area about key data. And then you peel that away and there's a bunch of technical appendices. And so um, the information that I've been reading off to you um, and these charts, those are mostly gonna be in the technical appendices. And that's what takes up the bulk of the report. Um, but is, given how long it is, I just wanna kind of prepare you and help you understand why it is taking a while to put it together. Um, we're also having it reviewed by um, consultants as well as internal staff before it comes to you. Um, because as we've talked about, you know, you can look at the data in silo, but then this right now is our opportunity to make those connections between things like we were talking about here, you know, efficiency measures and dwellings and multifamily and income and bringing all of that stuff together. And it's, and um, it takes some time to do that. So, so for those reasons, we're not ready. Um, we hope to have the report for you at the October 21st meeting, um, that that would be the first meeting that we'd be able to go through it. I feel pretty confident now that we'll be able to do that. Um, but it, it, as before, it's all dependent on getting the rest of the building permit data tied up in a bow um, because we want to make those connections and we can't make those connections in the report till we have the full picture. So I just wanted to give you all that update um, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. 
um because i think we've ha we have a couple people that have joined us that i know yes. we want to talk to yes well i'm gonna i'm gonna take care of our the important business of our uh approval of our minutes first so i like i mentioned um we hadn't gotten to that because we just jumped right into item number three on the agenda so I'm going to ask if there, if someone would like to make a motion to approve our meeting minutes, Zoom meeting summary from August 19th, or any any issues with those or anything else? I am. Go ahead, Howard. Oh yeah, I'll move with the um, changes that uh, uh, Elena mentioned at the beginning of the meeting. Right, okay, moved by Howard, seconded by Kevin. Any discussion? The uh, items that we discussed, um, for those of you who weren't here, they're just, it, it mentioned John, I believe John Borowski is, is the chair and Howard is still on there. So Elena needed to just change that. Otherwise, uh, I'll go ahead and call for the vote. So I, all those in favor, if you wanna just do this, um, or give me a thumbs up or whatever. Uh, so all those in favor? Let's see. Got a couple screens to have to go through here. And then any opposed? And then how about the abstentions? So I know we've got a few of those. Yeah. Okay. Got that, Elena? Okay, took care of that one. Um, so I think we'll move on to um, Heather. I'll have you do the membership update if that's okay. And then yes, we'll I'd love to. Chef. Great. Um, yeah. So you all may see that we have a new member in our Hollywood Squares, Dennis Reynolds. Um, welcome. So he is our new Sustainability Commissioner um, representative. And so he snuck on here, I think, while I was talking, um, but he will be joining us now. And Dennis, you're um, a newer Sustainability Commission member, is that right? Yep, new to that commission and new to this role as the liaison from that commission. So I'm got a steep learning curve. So you'll hear, you'll, you'll, you won't hear a lot from me for a while other than when I get to the point where I can formulate some of the questions that are spinning. Well, welcome, we're happy to have you. And I, you're not alone in the, the learning curve. I'm constantly in a learning curve. So I think there's a lot of us who would, would agree that, um, you know, we are, we need our, a lot of us have to have our hands held a little bit through this process because it's quite technical. So but we're, Glad to have you. And the staff is amazing. So if you have questions, they're they're great. Okay. Um, Michelle has joined us. Our hi Tiffany. Hi. Welcome. Um, I figured we figured we would would we waited for you. So we figured we would let you uh, deliver your news. Thank you for waiting. Sorry about that. Um, so I wanted to update everyone that I will be resigning from the ETAC. This will be my last meeting. Um, I am, my husband and I are moving out of state and we will be um, taking off here within the month. So I just wanted to say that thank you for just everything that I've learned with everyone over the past three years. Oh my gosh. Yes, is it three? Yeah, almost, almost three. Um, and Tiffany, you said it, you know, you're always learning. There's this is very technical information, but I told Heather, I remember sitting in her office, looking at her spreadsheet at the very beginning of this thinking, wow, I've got a lot to learn and I have. Um, and I just, it was great to get to know all of you. Obviously it was better when we were all in that room together, but um, I wish the ETAC, just great success. I know it's going to be successful because the staff has put their just brilliance into it. And so I will keep up with it because I'm very curious about what happens. Um, and it was just wonderful to know all of you and be a part of this. So thank you. And um, 
this is goodbye. Well, Michelle, we wish you the very best and it sounds like exciting things are going on for you. So that's, that's great. And of course, of course we will miss you. And of course I was my vice chair. So yes, um, we, will be, we will be electing a vice chair at a future meeting. Uh, so I just want to let everybody know that and maybe be thinking about um, whether or not that would be a role you'd be interested in. Um, I think, I mean, Heather or Elena could probably elaborate, but it's, it's in, in the absence of the, of the chair, then you would kind of run the meetings and, um, usually get a little bit of a preview on the agenda and whatnot ahead of time, but it's pretty simple. So, um, I think, okay, that's it. Does anybody have any questions or comments or anything to add? Um, Heather, Elena? about you guys. I just want to say thanks again to Michelle. Um, thank you for all of your time. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm sorry that we couldn't get you the 115 and going <laughs> document for you to review. So <laughs> maybe we'll send you a copy anyway, but thank you so much. Um, and Rick, it's great to see you. Welcome back. And Dennis, thank you again for, um, for joining us. So we just really appreciate everybody's time. Okay, well, I'm not gonna keep you any longer. So if there is no more official business, then I'm gonna go ahead and adjourn our meeting for this evening. So meeting adjourned. I'm gonna miss you, Michelle. Thanks. We'll see you soon.